So welcome. On behalf of the Center for the Study of Ethics, it is my pleasure to announce the winner of the 2020 David R. Keller Sustainability Prize. Uh, my name is Brian Birch and I serve as the center's director. And today I have the privilege of being part of an award that recognizes organizations that demonstrate exceptional innovation and leadership on sustainability issues. This is an annual award that is open to governmental, nonprofit, and for-profit organizations. And before we announce the winner, I want to take just a minute or two to talk about the person after whom the award is named. Uh, David Keller was the director of the Center for the Study of Ethics from 1999 until his untimely passing in 2013. Among David's many accomplishments, he was a scholar of and advocate for environmental ethics. His work at UVU and in his field of study has had an impact on countless thousands of students. He was a dynamic teacher, public intellectual, and friend to many of us at UVU and beyond. Time, I want to just recognize and introduce members of the Keller family uh, who have joined us here today. So I invite them to switch their camera on. Hello. Uh, so from, from left to right uh, is Dr. Richard Keller, David's father. Uh, in the middle is Anina Merrill, uh, David's wife. And to the right is Christine, Christina Keller Enzyme, David's sister. So I'm so delighted that you could join us here this morning for this award. And I just wanna take this opportunity to publicly thank you for all that you've done, both for the Ethics Center and for UVU students more broadly. So thank you for being here. Thanks for thank having you. us. It's a real pleasure. So without further delay, uh, we wanna present the 2020 David R. Keller Prize to Bike Utah, who submitted a fabulous application to improve the quality of bike transportation in our state. Uh, and Bike Utah is represented here today by Chris uh, Wiltsey, who serves as the program director. So Chris, we invite you to turn on your camera and say hello. Hello. And I also want to bring in Dr. Thomas Bretz, who is the faculty fellow for environmental ethics here in the Ethics Center. So Thomas, we welcome you. And I am now going to step back and turn the time over to Dr. Bretz and to Chris to talk a little bit more about the project itself and to, uh, to answer a few questions. So without further ado, proceed. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Brian. Um, and yeah, also, you know, I'm also, I think, just, you know, want to uh, support everything you said, I think about, you know, the, the Keller family. So thank you so much for you know, supporting this and working with us. Like, you know, it's, it's really great to kind of have, you know, have this kind of support on, on important issues like that. And yeah, thanks Chris, you know, for, for the proposal um, because it really, I think we got some really nice and strong proposals. And, you know, I think like this one really stood out, I think because it, you know, it seems such a kind of inherently sensible, you know, project. Um, so it was, you know, I think we were very happy to read about it. Um, but yeah, so I think what I would maybe just invite you to do right now is maybe just tell us a little bit about Bike Utah, you know, kind of what is its mission, maybe some of its accomplishments, and then also specifically um, how you might use the, the prize money um, of $5,000. Um, if you could, yeah, speak to that. Yeah, so Bike Utah is the statewide kind of advocacy organization for um, improving bicycling in the state. So what that means is every we're talking about everything from laws that are passed to actually advocating and supporting uh, the creation of infrastructure facilities that make it safer and more comfortable and more fun to ride. So my program specifically is called the Thousand Miles Program. And the governor of Utah set a goal a few years ago of adding a thousand miles of family friendly bike facilities throughout the state. And um, so I'm tasked with making sure that's happening. So what I do in my position is I support communities in uh, planning out and finding funding and eventually building bicycle facilities. So kind of um, supporting them throughout that whole process. 
Um, as far as how we're planning on using this money is um, the, so currently in Utah, we very much have kind of a recreational mindset in bicycling. And one thing that I've been looking a lot into and researching is this idea of um, who are the people who are already currently using bicycling and why or how are they affected by the way that we build our transportation system. And so um, kind of preliminary research has shown us like nationally, there are all these statistics around underrepresented groups, right? Whether that's racially or um, economically um, disadvantaged or underrepresented groups that they're riding at um, higher rates than a lot of other groups. So like middle-class Americans or um, white folks. And um, they're in some cases sort of require or they're um, they have to ride because like they don't have a car. Um, there's all these other issues around that. Um, it can be expensive to own and maintain a car. So uh, the idea with this grant would be to take that money and hire an intern who specializes in GIS analysis. And we're going to start looking at a lot of these different ideas and actually getting hard data that can show um, what does our bicycle ridership in our different communities throughout the state actually look like? Because that can in then inform how we invest our money in our transportation system and um, in bicycling. So maybe instead of focusing on a recreational mindset that meets the needs of a certain group, we could shift more to a util utilitarian perspective that meets the needs of people who um, have to ride their bike and don't have any other options. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I really love that. And I think that was one of the, you know, the elements in the proposal, I think that, that I think also really spoke to us, the kind of environmental justice aspect of it, right? Because I, I think like most people, when you think about environmental justice, you know, you think about, you know, kind of the worst cases or about pollution, you know, things like that, whereas, which is of course also very important, but, you know, I think like this kind of, you know, these different paradigms you talked about recreational, which usually kind of means groups that are already, you know, like fairly, um, you know, privileged versus, you know, who actually needs biking. I think that was something that I thought was, was really amazing. We all thought was quite amazing about the proposal. Um, could you maybe say a little bit more about, you mentioned, you know, this term GIS analysis. Um, could you maybe uh, say a little bit more about what that entails? Yeah, so I applied for a different grant about a year ago, and it gave us access to this platform called um, Streetlight Platform or Streetlight Insight. And basically what you can do with that is you can take cell phone pings from um, people who are traveling and um, you can differentiate the type of travel that they're doing. So whether they're driving in a car or walking or biking. And so basically you can kind of estimate throughout your whole city as if you actually had somebody out there like counting and observing how people are driving. Um, you can estimate how many people are riding their bikes and where they're riding and different things like that. And you can take all that data from that platform and you can put it into this other platform called ArcGIS. And you can do all these really interesting analyses where you could compare in a certain area, um, like things like income related to uh, bicycling. So we've, we've already done a similar analysis to that. And we found that there's like a negative correlation between at least in the Provo or Springville area, there's a negative correlation between um, how much money you're making. So the more money you make, the less likely you are to ride, which sort of reinforces this whole idea that um, people with less money are um, using their bikes for utilitarian purposes. No, that's really great. Thanks. That's a really good explanation. And, you know, I think that's kind of really fascinating to have access to that data. Um, I was also curious, you know, of course, this data will be hugely important to actually fix some of these issues, you know, provided there's the political will to kind of do that. Um, and, you know, so on your, on your website, um, bikeuta.org, right, you have listed some of the accomplishments, you know, of, of your organization in the past. But I was also actually curious, you know, whether you actually get a lot of pushback, you know, on kind of this project of establishing, you know, kind of more bike-friendly infrastructure. And I think we all know 
there's this kind of a little bit of a you know antipathy between you know car drivers and bicyclists partly because there's no infrastructure right but i was just wondering could you tell us a bit about maybe some of the the challenges you see or how optimistic you are about you know actually really translating this into kind of the, the vision you described earlier yeah I, i think if we're talking about recreation i think most people um, are on board with investing in that because there's such broad support so if you look at a lot of the major facilities that have been built um, they definitely sort of bend towards recreation and where they're located um, they sort of represent a certain group of people but if you're if you start talking about um, bicycle or bicycling for utilitarian purposes or because you kind of have to get somewhere I, I think that's a kind of a more difficult question. And I think um, for me, we need to start asking more questions around like our values and our ethics as it relates to transportation. Like what do we actually want represented? Because I think too often we jump to technical questions like um, what kind of facility should be here instead of asking who do we want to serve? Um, and I think that's where this data can come in as far as like speaking to engineers who are very data driven, but also calling into question some of the assumptions that we've made and um, at least starting a discussion around what values we want represented. Um, and and I, don't, I don't like pretend to have all those answers. Like I know, I know where I, I stand, but I think we at least need to even start having that conversation as opposed to just kind of assuming that everybody's riding recreationally and there's not like a significant population riding for practical purposes. Yeah, that's, that's really great. And I, I do think that is something, you know, again, I think that the Center for the Study of Ethics is really also cares about this, you know, additional perspective of asking about values and, you know, like basically what, what do we want right in the end for in a good society. So I think I really love kind of the way you, you framed that. Um, but yeah, I would also kind of like to invite others to ask questions. So I think Richard, you had a, a question. Um, so if you want to chime in. Well, I, I do. Uh, David and I uh, like to ride, well, I did when I was younger, a bicycle around Rockville over to Virgin uh, uh, and to Colorado City and other places. And the uh, Highway 9 and Highway 59 are uh, dangerous, basically. And uh, I would like to know how you're going to integrate safety into your plan with, uh, well, Provo, Orem, uh, very conservative uh, uh, communities, uh, not perhaps very uh, amenable to change. How do you interact with the political uh, 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 power structure of those communities that you serve? Yeah, so the, the program I'm over is the Thousand Miles program, and it's been framed as a thousand miles of family-friendly bicycle facilities. So I think sort of from the get-go, we're already trying to speak that language of um, like family-friendliness. Um, and around safety, The, and this goes back to this whole data issue, but um, kind of the idea there is that as vehicle speeds and the number of vehicles increases, so does the, um, the intensity of infrastructure. So if you imagine um, like a neighborhood street, you would need less infrastructure than maybe on a highway, like what you're um, describing. So on a highway, you would actually want to have like a separated path to increase like that safety and um, comfort. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, and, and I think having that data, you can start um, speaking the language of a lot of the policymakers and sort of the, the technical individuals like engineers, um, because you can show them, or you can, you can sort of show them that uh, what they assume isn't actually happening. And here's the sort of hard numbers of this is, these are the people who are actually riding. So let's first build infrastructure for them. And then we can start um, building infrastructure for people to entice people to start riding, if that makes sense. So basically 
you're developing it into database to try to convince the decision makers to uh, accept uh, bicycles in the communities. Is that uh, yeah, and, it, and it's also yeah, exactly. And it's also kind of shifting the perspective on what kind of infrastructure we build and where we build it. So um, for me, like thinking about planning and transportation planning and sort of city planning in general, I think for, and this is my perspective, this is, isn't necessarily everybody's perspective in planning, but I think the most, most ethical and kind of good way to plan is to decrease the distance between your origin and your destination. And um, that, that is a very different way of building a city than how we currently build cities where um, everything is pretty spread out. And if you're talking about like environmental justice or ethics, like that spread out model is um, very unsustainable in terms of resources and, um, and even like equity within our cities. Uh, one more short question. What does the definition of uh, infrastructure mean? Are the bicycle lanes and bridges, uh, uh, walking and biking bridges, uh, is that what you're talking about with it, infrastructure? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, that would be part of it. Um, some of it is, or in a lot of cases, and what I'm talking about is like the actual sort of physical paths. Um, because in my program, we actually don't do a whole lot with um, like, sort of your traditional bike lane where it's just a painted line on the street a lot of it is more um, intense or robust than that so a lot of it is like actual physical curbs that are separating the bicyclist from um, cars or like a separated median and then there's a pathway that people can ride on so it's it's more of what you might see in like uh, Copenhagen or like Amsterdam something like that as opposed to kind of this well, thank you very much yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for, for these questions. I think, I mean, we want to keep this short and sweet because we know that people have a lot, you know, of things to watch on the web these days, but maybe just kind of um, one last question that I think would be interesting, maybe also for everyone watching. Um, namely, do you think, Chris, there's anything that kind of, you know, the general public, like all of us, right? You look at this project and think like, oh, this sounds really great. I think we, we want to support this. Is there anything that kind of any of us can do to actually help make this happen? Yeah, I, I think as residents or um, citizens, a lot of the time what what happens when there's like a really cool project is we don't come out and show our support for it. And so a lot of times all the city council is hearing is um, the naysayers, so the people who don't like it for whatever reason. Um, so, so I think that's a big thing is like showing up and showing your support for these things. So you kind of change the narrative in the minds of the policymakers. And also, um, I, I think also we need to accept like if we are, and, and maybe maybe some people aren't and um, that's, that's for them to decide, but um, if we all sort of want a more equitable society um, that's just and fair, then um, we need to sort of realize or accept that there are going to be sacrifices on our, our part. So fundamental to that uh, sort of idea is that we have certain privileges that exist. So for example, in transportation, um, that might mean that we have to take a lane out, uh, like an automobile lane to put in a bicycle lane and, and or takes out parking or kind of shift how things are distributed in the street. Um, because you, you can think about that as like, that's a redistribution of, of sort of the fairness and the equity in our system um, and, and being okay with that and understanding what that actually represents, especially through the lens that I'm talking about of like, these are the very poorest people and a lot of other people who are underrepresented in our communities that those kinds of, of facilities are actually supporting and helping. Yeah, no, thank you so much. That's, yeah, that's really great. Um, so as I said, I think we're kind of about out of time, but yeah, I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, like Brian or, you know, like the, the Keller family, if you still have any kind of final comments or questions, but yeah, thank you so much, Chris. And I think we're really, 
um, you know, kind of excited to see what, you know, what you kind of do with, you know, with this project and, you know, with the prize. So it's, yeah, I think we're very excited kind of to see all your future work. Thank you. Yeah. From our perspective in the center, uh, I, I would just want to express uh, how much we share the enthusiasm for the project. Uh, we're looking forward to finding ways in which uh, UVU students might be able to get involved uh, and connected to it. And uh, we're just very proud of the efforts that our university is making toward sustainability issues more broadly. Uh, this is part, this, this prize and the Environmental Ethics Symposium and other uh, events are part of Sustainability Week, which has been building and growing over the years. And uh, Chris, we're proud to have you be part of this and, and better connected to UVU. And I'm a UVU alumni as well, so. That's terrific, all the better. <laughs> and again, thanks to the Keller family for taking time to be part of this and uh, for your support. We appreciate it very much. Our pleasure, our Thank pleasure. So you. without further ado, uh, more information will be coming on the project uh, in coming days and we will keep uh, information coming out of our Center for the Study of Ethics website. So if anyone who is watching wants to know more, you can just Google Center for the Study of Ethics, UVU, and uh, we'll have more information for you there. Uh, until then, uh, be well. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, Bye. so that, so we'll cut the video there, and uh, that, I think that's,